guide us and direct us. Lord, we ask that you would speak through your word. We want to see you and we want to know you. We want to be right in the middle of your will. So teach us tonight. In your precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good evening again. And as we turn to what will be a controversial text for many, um, and I've titled it, uh, The Marks of a Hypocrite, please understand this. Be honest with yourself. There's a little hypocrite in all of us. And we don't like to admit that. We, we're all prideful. We're all arrogant. And in some ways, a, a person may be, uh, appear to be humble. They may to appear on the outside, just have everything together, and just the sweetest person. And yet inside, there's this, this battle going on. And see, this is what Jesus is going to address tonight, is really the hypocrisy of the, the leadership See, Jesus is warning the religious leaders of their evil ways. Unless they confess, unless they repent, judge what will come upon them. When they're walking in their hypocrisy, they're walking in rebellion to God. And it'd be tonight that we'll see eight woes. And really, the woes is, is a warning against false religion. See, religion is where man is trying to get to God, or he can assume that he's good enough to go to heaven. But for that person that's born again, he understands that he has a relationship and that he is born again, that he's born from above. It's a supernatural work. He knows he's unworthy of even salvation, but, but the mercy and grace of God is so sufficient to save him and continue to save him. Well, Jesus is dealing really, again, I want to bring this point with the religious leaders, and we'll see this later on. He, they are the blind leading the blind. And they're going to be accountable, really, for their actions, their attitudes, and their words. Well, look with me in verse 1 of our text. That's, again, Matthew 23, verses 1 through 12. We're going to look at what they sought. That's the religious leaders, the scribes. And it says, and Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, the scribes and Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Now, we need to first ask that question. What is the chair of Moses? The seat of Moses is generally what is referred to. It is a, a stone seat that the leader, the, the one in the greatest authority in that synagogue would sit in and he would teach and all the people would stand. And now notice what it says in that text beginning in verse 2. It says, and the scribes and Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. They have exalted themselves. They have put themselves in a place of authority. They're taking that authority and controlling and manipulating the people. Think back with me just for a moment. In, 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 the, in Matthew chapter 5 through 7, we have that Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus would say very frequently, you heard it said, but I say. And he would go on and give an explanation of the law. The true meaning, God's real intent in the scripture. See, these scribes and Pharisees, they, they were the ones that were interpreting and the people had to follow. And Jesus came along on that Sermon on the Mount and, and you heard it said, but I say. And he was correcting their teaching. They exalted themselves and used the very word of God to manipulate the people. Now notice again, Jesus spoke to the crowds and he spoke to his disciples. There are those that are the crowds. It means there's a multitude, but they're not necessarily disciples. 
disciples are ones that are followers of Christ. They want to be like Christ. They put themselves under his authority. So you have you have, always have in a crowd the mixed. You have those that are unbelievers and those are believers. And Jesus now speaking to them describes again the place of authority that these men have exalted themselves. Now God intended for always to be a leader. But sometimes that power goes to the head of people. Again, in Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard it said, but I say. See, when we read, we read with the intent to hear God. What is God really saying? And what does God really want us to know? Why is he saying this? Or even books have, books have a main theme, and there's many things taught within it, but there's a theme. And that's what we need to know is really, what does God want us to know? Look with me in verse 3. In response to those first two verses, this is therefore all that they tell you do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds. For they say things and not do them. And we're going to learn what those things are. But what he's saying is they're in this place of authority and you need to listen to them and you follow them because if you're obeying them and submitting to them the best of your ability, you're submitting unto the Lord and you're honoring the Lord. Now, they would again make all these laws, these rules, and, and they would be like a burden we're going to see in a few minutes. They would lay it upon the people. They couldn't keep it themselves, but, but they would lay it upon. They would make it so difficult that people couldn't even keep it. See, this is what false religion does. It, it is a, a religion of hypocrisy. Now, it's, it's good to obey their preaching, but it's not good to follow their practice. Maybe you've heard a, a father, a mother, do as I say, not as I do. Like, I have this privilege, I can do whatever I want to do. You want to follow a leader that's following Jesus Christ, following the very word of God. Now, verse 3 says again, therefore all that they tell you do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds or their works, for they say things and do not do them. See, and, and they, they have this, this, this place of holiness. They seem to be so holy. They know the word so much. I've, I've known people through the, the years. A, a young gal would come up and say, oh, this guy is so holy. He's so pure. He, he, he's a servant of God. And yet this man was as moral as anyone could be. He looked to manipulate and take advantage of, of young girls. People aren't always what they seem. We always want to put on our best because we want to impress people. We often want to impress people because we want to get something from them. Look at verse 4 with me. And speaking of these scribes and these Pharisees, says they, they tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a, as a finger. Now, it's been said about these Pharisees, they, they sought to build a fence around the law, establish rules so strict that people could not even come close to, to, again, breaking God's law. I know a pastor years ago, he, he would have church every night a week, not to come and worship God, but to prevent people from sinning. He was saying, if you don't come, you're in sin. And he wanted to control and manipulate. He wanted people to think that he's so holy because he does all of this stuff. Well, this is, again, a, a false religion. And they lay in what we learn about false religion in the mark of these, again, these hypocrites. They, they lay, lay heavy burdens upon the people. They, they impose heavy rules and laws. And I, I used to know a church and I, the pastor is gone, but they would measure skirts as people come in. If they weren't the, the right height, they would ask the people to go. 
You know what I hope is that the, this church would fill up with all kinds of people. It would fill up with sinners that come and get saved. Because they come and they see people that love God and love each other. They're patient and kind and merciful and, and gracious. They don't see people just trying to keep rules. They see people that are just simply loving. Loving God and loving others. But these, again, lay these heavy burdens, the, the rules and regulations. And sometimes people feel safe in that environment. It, it, it's like, okay, I, I'm, I'm here. I know I'm okay. Like an animal that's been in a cage all of its life and turned loose, it goes back into the cage. These rules do not save you. It's a savior that will save you. And we turn our lives over to him. And, and so what they're doing is putting people in this situation. Now, there's a question that, that arises. In what sense did these scribes and these Pharisees tie up these heavy burdens upon the people? Unwilling to, to, to lift them up. Well, the Pharisees and, uh, again, and scribes, they interpret the law of Moses in such a way that it was extremely burdensome. 633 rules. No one could know them all. No one could remember them all. And the people carry this heavy guilt, this burden. And I love it in, in Matthew 11. Come, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Not come to the law, come to Jesus. Take my yoke, it's light and easy. He's the one that's going to, to carry it. You fulfill the law as you come to Christ and you love with the love of Christ and his love flows through you. Well, this false religion is a, a religion of show. Again, you see these men, the men of the cloth, sometimes it's been used to illustrate the most holy priest, most holy pastor, the, the reverent, we're just men like you. We have our struggles. We're growing. We're maturing. Sometimes churches come and you have to have your, your best clothes on, a white shirt and a tie if you're a guy and you have, a woman has to dress a certain way. Rules. If you're not wearing the best and buying the best, then, then God's not impressed. You're not pleasing him. He's not honored with you. These men also like the place of Position. They like people looking up to them, calling them all the different titles. They wanted to be honored and exalted by men. There's only one person in this world you need to really please. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're married and you're pleasing the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be pleasing your wife and you'll be pleasing your husband. It's also a, a, a religion of Again, titles is, again, people like the titles. It makes me more important. You know, it doesn't matter when a person comes in through the doors. Everyone is important, whether they're rich, they're poor. They read their Bible many times a day or once a day or once a week. Every person is significant, important, so much that Jesus Christ died upon the cross for every single person. For God so loved the world, that's the Father, he gave his only begotten Son, and whosoever believe in him will not die, but will not perish, but have everlasting life. The moment you put your trust and faith in Jesus, you have favor. He loves you as much and is pleased with you as much as is that first day as it is 10 years down the road. You may grieve his heart, but you have special favor with him. Look with me in verse 5. But they, referring again to those scribes and Pharisees, but they do all their deeds to be noticed by men. For they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen their tassels of their garments. So their motive was to be seen. Now you know how little kids are and, 
And I, I remember our kids playing out in the yard one time and my son fell over and he kind of like skinned his knee. And he was fine. And, and, but then when he saw us looking at him, he began to cry. When he sees you're not looking at him, he doesn't cry. He goes off in place. We like that look. We want that attention. And what they're doing is to get attention, to find favor of men. Now, it mentions this word in here, phylacteries. What are they? Well, it would be like in most cases a little plastic box that would fit on their, their head. A series of ties and even going down the arms. You can read about it in, in Deuteronomy 6 verse 8 and chapter 11 and verse 18. And there were little, in, in these little boxes there would be like uh, sometimes a prayer or the shima, shima was in the middle of that. Sometimes they'd have different types of scripture. Different people would have different things and they would have tassels. Sometimes the, the tassels for some people were under their garments and sometimes they're on the outside. All these were reminders of their relationship, but they would do it in such a way that people would see them. So these boxes went from little to, to, to big boxes like they were more holy and the tassels would become longer and more colorful. Doing things to be See, it's interesting in Matthew 6, 1, again, this is from the Sermon on the Mount, some of the most powerful words, again, in the book of Matthew. And some say, well, this is, this is how you're to live during the millennial kingdom. No, this is for people that want to live in the kingdom now. If you've been born again, you, you begin to experience the blessings of the kingdom while you do not have the fullness of it, this is how you and I are to live. These are, this is the explanation. And the Pharisees, is, again, and the Sadducees, the, the scribes hated this. And he says in Matthew 6, 1, Beware practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. It goes on in other passages. Well, your reward is, is, is by people giving you favor. Again, the only one that ever matters is what God thinks. But you know, people do things to be seen, focused on. They don't do it because they like it. They, they do it because they want to call attention to themselves. That's a dangerous place to be. Now, I remember when I was first going out with my wife and I would get my hair all spiffy when I still had some hair up there and, and all the different things and I put on my best shirt and, uh, it, and certainly you want to impress people in that way. But some people, it is a life of hypocrisy. They're worried and do everything they do to get attention from other people. And that's what these Sadducees and Pharisees did. Well, look with me in verse 6 of our text, and it says they love the place of honor and banquets and the chief seats in the synagogue. So they wanted to be always exalted. You know, there are people that come to church. There's some that, that sit in the back row, and there's some that sit in the front row. And, and, and some churches, they even have, again, seats up on the stage. So you can see the most holy men, and not saying that all of those men are that way and they think that way. Sometimes they're put up there just to, to demonstrate those are the leaders before the congregation, but some like to be seen that way. That's important for them to be seen, but in God's eyes, it's disgusting. Look with me in verse 7, and it continues in that same thought and, res and respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by men, rabbi being a, a teacher, but looking, oh, there's the rabbi. And, and even in our culture here, oh, he's a pastor. Oh, he's this. I want to be able to talk to people. I want people to be able to talk directly to me, not at me. Not about me behind. I don't want people to, to put me on this pedal so, so high, so when I do fall, and I am human being, and I will sin, that, that this great fall, like Humpty the Dumpty, and couldn't be put back together again. We're human beings. We need to hold one another, encourage one another, and it's not about impressing one another. 
No false religion is a religion to, again, to be guarded against. There's something you and I do in the church, and we, it, it's guard against false religion, against hypocrisy. You know, we should be transparent and honest with one another. Notice what it says in verse 8 in our text, though. But do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, and you are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Do not be called leaders, for one is your leader, that is Christ. But the greatest among you shall be a servant, and whoever exalts him shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. Now, please focus on the context. The context is the hypocrisy. One and be called this most holy rabbi, exalted above all the other people. See, that's the idea here. A teacher is not wrong to call somebody a rabbi or a teacher. And certainly Jesus was called that, and he saw no disrespect in the others. Uh, he saw no disrespect. But it's the attitude behind it, wanting to be exalted, to be seen that they're higher than everyone else. Now, notice again, verse 10, do not be called leaders. There's one, the leader, who is Christ. We know that Christ is our Messiah, our Savior. We, we understand that. And, and so nothing compared to Christ. We don't put anyone on the same level as Christ or God the Father. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. He leads us in all truth, the scripture says. Now, the contrast comes here again that it's interesting in verse 11. It says, but the greatest among you shall be a servant, a servant. And whoever exalts himself shall be humbled and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. It's not about being a leader. That's something that, that God calls and raises people up and puts them in that position. That's what God does. And God ministers through them. And the work that's done is, is his work. But if you want to be great in the kingdom, this is the contrast to this. They, they want the title. Then be a servant, a servant of all. Jesus come not to be served, but to serve others. Jesus come to lay down his life for you and me, yet he was God in the flesh. He's the example that we follow. So if, you, if you're willing to lay down your life and follow him, then that's what makes you great. Great in the kingdom. When everyone pats you on the back. Okay, that's all you're going to get if you're doing it for the reason to be seen. Now, how do you know a teacher? How do you know a, a leader? Because they will teach and people will follow. And when they lead, people will follow. And they're able to say, follow me as I follow Christ Jesus. Well, the, 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 the contrast he's talking about is this false religion. It needs to be guarded against, calling attention to ourselves, exalting ourselves. This is what he's talking about because the real measurement is service. So the question for, for you and me is, how am I serving the Lord? How am I laying down my life for the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, number one would be as if you're going and making disciples. It could be as simple as when somebody is struggling with something and they're, they're seeking uh, wisdom and direction. You can open the word. You can pray with them. And, and it will show up and reflect in different ways. But it shows that you care about people. You're doing these things because you care. You care, number one, about God. And then you care about others. You want to be great. Be a servant of all. The warning again in verse 12 focuses again on the fact that uh, judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. Most people realize that something has to give. There has to be a change. It, it can't continue to go on 
the way it's going on. It just doesn't make sense. Well, let's look at the next section. It's here that in verse 20 or 13, excuse me, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from, from people, for you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go into. It's here that we see a, a beginning, a series of eight woes, woes directed at the scribes, at the Pharisees. It begins right here. This is, this is heavy because this is strong because these are words of condemnation. Whenever you see these woes in the Old Testament, it is of condemnation. These scribes and Pharisees refuse to see that they're under condemnation. Notice again, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, and he, very strongly hypocrites. You're not entering into the kingdom. You're shutting up the kingdom, shutting off the kingdom of heaven from people. The people that you're responsible for, the people that you're to lead, you're, you're to lead them into the kingdom. You're to open up the word and explain it to them. Not to tickle their ears with what they want to hear, but to bring the truth to them. And the fact is, you're not entering in and you're not leading people in. And yet you're this religious leader. You're a hypocrite. This is what he's saying. And this, this whole passage contradicts the Beatitudes that I mentioned earlier. So different. Again, Jesus said, you heard it said, but I say. See, they exalted themselves and they interpreted in the way they wanted to interpret it so they can control the people. They could be patted on the back. They could be selfish and greedy. They could be served by the people. The Pharisees simply prevented others from entering the kingdom of God. How? By discouraging people from following Jesus. To curse him. To deny that he is the Christ, the Messiah. Because they would have tested these things. The scriptures showed what the, again, the miracles of the Messiah, the marks of the Messiah. And yet they rejected these because they did not want to believe. Because they didn't want to believe, they weren't going to let anyone else believe. So these false religiousness shut the door to heaven against all those seeking, seeking to, to know the truth. These are people that were desperate, wanting to know. They were needing help, needing to, to know salvation, needing forgiveness for their sins, needing the peace of God. And they would lead the people away. Notice they did not enter in, and there's three reasons that they themselves didn't enter in. Number one, they rejected, again, God as the Messiah. Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the Lord of heaven, the very Son of God, God in the flesh, they rejected him. He claimed to be God, and they rejected that fact. The second is, again, they preferred their own ideas of religion rather than God's ideas. It's interesting as a pastor, the things you hear, and, and someone might say to me or another pastor might say something like this. Well, that's what you believe, but that's not what I believe. That's a dangerous place to be. What does the Bible say? Did what I read and explained, did that not line up with the word? Yeah, but I don't believe that. What they're really saying is I don't want to accept that. And that was what was true of the Pharisees, the religious leaders. They wanted, again, to be honored by man. They thought they could live in such a way that they could be good enough to go to heaven. They wanted a religion that honored, again, men for their good works instead of honoring God for his mercy and his grace that was extended through the cross and the resurrection 
And the third thing is that they chose the world over God's demand for self-denial. Again, you probably heard me mention it. If anyone want to come after me, Jesus' words, he must deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me daily. That's not maybe. Those who want to follow him, this is the life you live. And, and so it, this is Jesus' words. They didn't deal with it, but that's how the church does today. They're going to tell the people what they want to hear. Just say a sinner's prayer, you're saved. Just come to church, just tithe every, every week. That will not save a person. It's, it's being born again. Just do good works. But in Matthew, again, it describes people that had cast out demons, done miracles in Jesus' name, and Jesus said, go away, I never knew you. Do you know him? as your personal Lord and Savior? Do you know that he is the one that sustains you and keeps you? You know, if he's called you to do something, then he will enable you and he will provide those needs for you. See, they chose the things of the world, position and honor, recognition and esteem, wealth and power and authority and, and security. This must be I must be blessed by God if I have all these things. And what they were doing is fashioning their own I idols. This was a idolatry, and they didn't enter in because of that. Look again in verse 14 in our text. Look at their prayers. We're going to talk about, woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour widows' houses. For the pretense, you make long prayers, therefore you'll receive a greater condemnation. Now, th these false teachers, these false leaders, under a, a disguise, a, again, a guise of religion, they had greed in their mind. They, they would steal from these widows. They would take advantage of them as they're weak. And they would manipulate them. See, their hypocrisy. They used religion, prayer, call attention, most holy men of God. There were the Pharisees, the, the bruised and bleeding group. See, as they walked down the street, if a woman was on the other side of the street, they would walk over on the other side, and they would close their eyes and run into buildings and, and beat themselves up. Oh, look how holy they are. They were hypocritical. They knew they would find favor in the eyes of the people. People would look up to them. People would listen to them. The fact is there's a doom that they're headed for. Again, in verse 14, it, it talks about there's a greater condemnation. Why? Because they had the word of God. They had that access to God. God had made it clear in their hearts, but they rejected the truth, the truth that would set them free. Look with me in verse 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Again, this condemnation. Again, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. Strong words. Because you travel around, again, the sea and the land to make one proselyte. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. So, so they were missionary minded. I'm saying, look, look, you go to great lengths to, to make a proselyte. But it was of, of you, not of, of God, not of the Messiah. And they wouldn't enter into the kingdom. They brought a, 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 a gospel, which was not a gospel at all. It was a, a corrupt teaching. The followers were corrupt. Again, they, they sought again new converts. But they really weren't reaching people for God. See, what they were reaching is, again, a man-made religion based upon works. The Jewish people thought that's how you would approach God. There are churches today that have that same approach. Well, I know I'm saved, but if I want to find favor with God, I, I've got to keep the Sabbath. I've got to do this and I've got to do that. You have perfect favor with him. You may grieve his heart the choices you make. 
But when you know you have favor with him, when you know he set his love upon you, you want to serve him, you want to live for him, you want to please him. Not have legalism. This is what they brought about as a, a legalistic way of reaching to God. Almost like the Tower of Babel. They were going to build a building to God to reach the heavens. You can try all day with your good works and never, ever get there. The way up is down. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And he will exalt you in due, side, due times. Now, it's talking about a proselyte, a, a stranger or a sojourner. That comes from Exodus chapter 12, verses 48 and 49. But if a stranger sojourns with you, celebrates the Passover to the Lord, let all of his males be circumcised and then let him come near and celebrate. He shall be like a native of the land. But no uncircumcised person may eat of it. The same law shall apply to a native as to the stranger, the sojourner. So a proselyte is one that who wanted to live among the people. He became like the people. He, again, would go through the process of circumcision. He wanted to, to keep the feast. He recognized that there was one God. And, and, and they wanted to come into Judaism. And this is what they're talking about here. Now, proselyte is a, is, was a Gentile. You're either a Jew or a Gentile at that time. There's actually three different groups today. There's the Jew, the Gentile, and the believer. Which group are you? And that's important to understand. Are you a, a Jew or are you a Gentile? Or are you a believer? But some say, well, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Nazarene, I'm, I'm a missionary, I'm this. Our identity is not in the name on a building. Our identity is in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus alone. A believer believes in Christ Jesus. What he's done upon the cross, he died for you, for me, for our sins and raised from the grave. So again, this proselyte was a Gentile, through conversion, committed himself or herself, again, this is important to understand, to practice the Jewish law. They would follow, again, these leaders. They had exclusive devotion to Yahweh. They, they had this integration in the community. They become just like everyone else. That's a proselyte who became. He wasn't, he didn't have the DNA to, to become a believer. But he came from the outside. Within the church, we, we have people. When a person is born again, you're born into the, the body of Christ. You're not born into a denomination. You're born into Christ Jesus. You're a child of God. Now, go with me to verse 16. We see their principles of these, these false teachers. They mislead people. They're blind guides and in their oaths and commitments. They're, they're leading people astray. And verse 16 says, Woe to you, blind guides, who say, whoever swears by the temple, that is nothing, but whoever swears by the gold of the temple is obligated. You fools, blind men, which is more important, the gold or the temple that has sanctified the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, that is nothing. But whoever swears by the offering on it, he is obligated. You blind men, which is more important, the offering or the altar that sanctifies it? Therefore, whoever swears by the altar swears by both the altar and everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears both by the temple and by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears both by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Again, these false religious people, these leaders are leading, misleading people away. They're blind guides in their oaths, in their commitments. They're stressing things that are really, again, secondary, unimportant in some ways. 
Or did Jesus say he would meet you and me or God? Because Jesus is God. He would meet us in the Holy of Holies. He would meet us again between the cherubim on the mercy seat on their lid. That's where he would meet us. That's more important than any sacrifice. The greatest sacrifice that you could ever, ever bring to God is yourself. Give yourself totally, completely to him. But what they stress is, is really not the, the main things, but the least important things. They stress the gold of the temple over the temple itself. See, they had their priorities misplaced on the things that they could touch, the things that they could handle. Notice Christ used very strong words, and this is important to understand, against these religious people to the point, you fools, you're blind. Christ meant two things by these words, and that's important to understand. What they were doing and saying was absurd to him and irrational. Common sense tells a person that the temple itself is more important than, than a sacrifice you bring because that cannot really please God. God finds no pleasure in the sacrifice. What he wants is obedience to follow him. What they were doing and saying was really full of folly and sin. They were merely trying to invade the commitments and responsibilities of swearing. Some people don't even want to swear today because they misunderstand that whole thing. You know, we need to keep the main thing. What does God want from you, your heart, today? He wants all of you. And then whatever you give will always be pleasing. See, Christ pointed out the, the raw facts of these commitments and the oaths. God is one. To whom the sacrifice is made upon the altar. It's, it's him that's really important. It's God who dwells in the temple. It's, it's him that is being brought to. The sacrifice is not as important as him himself. God is the one that sits upon the throne and in heaven. The commitment is to God, not, not this sacrifice. They were, they were focusing upon the doing. It's interesting that, that people can fall into that same rut today. Well, what, what do you mean? You might say, well, we can put great emphasis upon rituals, ceremonies, and programs unless you do it this way. This is not pleasing to God, and that's not true. God says when we come to him, we come to him in spirit and truth. When you worship, no matter what style of music you do you connect with him, your spirit? When you hear the word taught, are you listening to hear him speak to your heart? We can make a greater emphasis, too, upon the gift that we give instead of the giver. Even today, there are many that are making great emphasis upon the gifts of the spirit instead of the giver himself who's given us. When we talk about money, what's important to understand, we're just stewards of the money. Everything is, is his. And we need to be led by him, how he wants to distribute it. It's not your call. It's not my call. It's not even our money. It's, again, it's his. That's what I like about this church, we have an offering box, and we never mention money unless I come to a text here, which is very rare. Healthy, happy sheep know how to give. You don't need to manipulate them. And you find that in the Old Testament. They manipulate them again and again and again. Well, look with me in verse 23. It says, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. Again, following that same pattern, Eight times I mentioned. And this is really their show of religion for you. Tithe, mint, dill, and cumin. Neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. But these are the things that you should have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides. 
You strain out the gnat and swallow the camel. He's so strong with him. He says, there's three things I want to call your attention to. It's justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These were the weightier things. This is the real important things. In fact, I want to read from Micah 6 a. He says, he has told you, O oh man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love kindness, and that's the same as mercy, and walk humbly with your God means you're going to walk in faithfulness. So there's, there's justice. It, justice is, is treating your neighbor as, as we should, doing and saying nothing that would hurt him, showing honor, showing respect to him, Never ever being guilty of injustice or allowing injustice to happen if, if someone would wrong your own kids. Second is that love kindness, or in our text it said mercy, but love kindness and mercy, they're interchangeable in this context. This is love kindness. Uh, showing care and concern and mercy and tenderness to all who are weak, bad, needy. Not being hard or distant or demanding or cruel. I remember years ago we had a, a study and many people come and they were sitting there. One guy leans over, Who, who's that guy over there? And, and you know, he was kind of mocking him. He looked weak and, and humble. And, and when that man began to speak, he was our guest speaker. The guy about fell out of his chair. He knew he was a man of God. He knew that God was speaking through him. We judge on the outside of things, and that's what this whole hypocrisy is, a, is about. We don't judge people in that way. Again, what we do is we walk by faith. By walking by faith, we're walking humbly, believing God, trusting him to fulfill every promise that he's given you and me. Will he fulfill those promises? Yes. In his time... In his way, but see, Christ said that, that they had neglected the weightier things of the law, the justice, mercy, and faith. Now, see, this is what false religion does. They minimize the things that are really important. What's important today is love. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength. Second is love your neighbor as yourself, and, and you'll fulfill the law when you do those things. Look with me in verse 25. It says, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, for you're clean on the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee first clean the inside of the cup of the dish so the outside may become clean also. Jesus again calls them hypocrites. Because the outward behavior was not equal with the inward, their false religion. They, they showed this, this, this beauty, this cleanness outward. It, it, they just looked so good. And the idea comes really from at the time of Passover, any of the festivals, any of the tombs that would be around in, in, in the area of, of Jerusalem, they would whitewash the outside of the tomb. So no one would go up and stumble over them and defile themselves. He says, you're like that. You're like a, a whitewashed tomb with dead man's bones inside. And, and what has to happen is you have to, to be clean from the inside out. And when a person's born again, we're changed from the inside out. I love that when people come into church, they're, they're saved. And they're, they're rough. And someone might say to them, oh, gosh, they're a little rough. Now watch, though. If they've truly been born again, you're going to see a change. You're going to see the language change. You're going to see their attitudes the way they look at others. They're going to become more conscious. And, and here's a life that is, is just a mess. And, and all of a sudden what God does is they change it from the inside, turns them right side up. And they're a total different person than they were once before. What they needed was to be clean from the inside out. They needed to be born again. Their focus was on the outside, and everyone thought they were so holy, but so far away. 
Again, in verse 27, it continues, Woe to you, the same phraseology, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, for you're like whitewashed tombs, as I just mentioned. The outside appear to be beautiful, but inside full of dead man's bones and uncleanliness. So you too outwardly appear to be righteous men, but inwardly you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. See, the hypocrite, if he's honest with himself, knows that he's a hypocrite. He knows what he's doing to draw attention to himself. He knows he loves that pat on the back. There's some that, that may get a pat on the back, and they're even embarrassed sometimes. Because they know if there's anything good in them, it's, it's what God has done, and it's, it's not them. See, Jesus is describing, again, these, these false religious people, these leaders, have disguised themselves, but inside there's this, this decay. There's this stench. There's this rot that's going on. They were full of hypocrisy. Look with me in Again, verses 29 through 36, as we move toward the end of our text tonight, notice what they thought. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, for you build tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of righteousness and say, if we had been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partners with them in shedding the blood of the Prophets. Well, let me stop there just for a moment. If you go to Israel, you go to Jerusalem, you'll see these tombs built up honoring these, these people. And they say, no, hey, look, this is not what we would have done. We would have never acted that way. There are many people who have told me, well, you know, if I were in the garden, if I were Adam, I would have never done what Adam and Eve did. Adam and Eve were the God's best because they were without sin. And surely you and I would have done the same thing. But God, knowing that, would provide his son to die for you and me. Now it goes on in verse 31. So you testify against yourselves that you are the sons of these murderers that murdered the prophets. And fill up then the measure of the guilt upon your fathers, you serpents, you brood vipers. How will you escape the sentence of hell. Now again, these false religious people that deprive themselves on this godly area, I would never act that way. I would never do. I'm from the, the line, but that's not me. They would honor, again, the, these, these buildings they would make in honor of these prophets. But they would have done the same thing. What's interesting is they, they denounce the the former abuses by their, their, again, fathers, meaning, again, those spiritual fathers that came before them. They pride themselves as being better. I would never do that. I would have not committed those sins. According to the scribes, when you stop and think about it, again, these scribes, it's important to understand that they were doing the same thing because, again, they would not acknowledge John the Baptist as that forerunner to the Messiah, and they would not acknowledge Jesus Christ, and they would turn their backs upon him, and they would cry out for a murder, for a sinner. And they would do the same thing to the apostles. In fact, their actions show that they were no better. In fact, they would fill up the Father's cups to murder. Look with me again. Verse 34, Therefore, behold, I'm sending you prophets, wise men, scribes, some of them. You will kill. Jesus is saying that and crucify. And some of them will scourge you in the synagogues and persecute you in city to city. So that upon you there will fall the guilt of the righteous blood and shed upon earth for the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah to the son of Berechiah whom you murdered between the temple and the altar truly I say to you all of these things will come upon this generation see it comes upon the generation because they're following in those same footsteps they had a false religion a religion that was made by man 
historically, we know that Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. First, they rejected the Messiah. Jesus had prophesied that. We'll see that next, next week in Matthew 24. Fulfilled in 70 AD. This generation will suffer these things. And there's one question before we finish tonight that every man needs to, to really face. When I'm gone, what will the verdict be? What kind of legacy will I leave on behind me? Did I hinder the work of God? Or was I a part of the work of God? See, there will be a final judgment one day. Let me read from Matthew 20, verse 12, the last verse tonight. And it says, I saw the dead, the great, the small, standing before the throne. And notice it says, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to the deeds. Now, the church has already gone to be with the Lord. They've been to that, uh, again, that Bema seat rewarded. But there are those that go through that tribulation. That final judgment is a book of life and a book of, let's say, of the dead, the deeds they've done. Is your name written in the book of life? What legacy will you leave on? What will people say after you're gone that you loved God and you loved others? You weren't worried about pleasing people, but you had one person to please. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. See, if you're living for Jesus Christ, really living for him, you will not be a hypocrite. You won't be worried what others think. You may be hurt. Because people may talk about you, gossip about you, and, and, and that's a struggle that all of us have. But you know there's only one to please. The Lord Jesus Christ who is pleased with everyone that has given his life to him. Won't you give your life to him if you haven't already? All who call upon his name will be saved. Father, thank you tonight for your word. Lord, we look at a, a text that's full of condemnation tonight. But it's because they rejected you. They wanted what the world offered. Lord, we don't want what this world offers. We want what you have for us. We want to be in your will. Father, I pray for anyone that is listening or watch in the days to come. God, if they've not received you as their Lord and Savior, or they're trying to work to find favor, may they give their lives to you. May they cast their cares upon you because you care for them. May they acknowledge what you have already done and find their favor in you and be blessed because you call them a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Sunday morning, we're back. We're going to be at 9 o'clock in the morning. We're going through the book of Revelation. We're in Revelation chapter 12. We're going to be looking at the great battle. And again, I encourage you to come out and stay in the word let me know uh, if there's a way that we can pray for you or encourage you. Thank you again for listening. May the God bless you richly tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.